Well, great. I, I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks again for the invitation. Uh, in July of 2018, I spent two weeks at the Linda Hall Library searching for materials about a fascinating episode in pest control history, the so-called War on Rats. When I opened the May 1946 issue of Pests and Their Control, which is an exterminator's industry magazine, I was immediately struck by the advertisements, especially this one. Only a year after the May 1945 armistice that ended World War II, this advertisement played on fresh memories of battle and imitated the recognized style of wartime news broadcasts and patriotic calls to arms. Flash, extra, extra, war declared on rats. And, and what was being advertised here? Well, the new chemical agent Petra, the poison gas all rodents fear, puts them on the run. Well, sold by New York's Sparhawk Company, the chemical may have been a good rodent killer, but their advert also called consumers to get into the fight, to enlist for this new war between species, now that the war between nations had ended. The image centers around the lanky soldier with impossibly alarm arms, legs, beard, and rifle, and he leads a squadron of skunks, chemical weapons, and animal form, with the caption, the atomizer brigade spearheads the attack. The bomb squad is on the march. They parade bravely along as four people and a dog cower behind the rocks on the right. The image was so powerful to me because it captured not only the rich analogies or metaphors that bonded world war and pest control, but also the more literal connections of pest control with chemical weapons development, with the role of the home front in total war, and with the use of soldiers and animals on the front lines of public health. These trends were more than half a century old when this image was published. It was far from the first time that humans had declared war on rats. And many historians describe the years from the late 1800s to the end of World War II in 1945 as an era defined by global and total warfare including many colonial wars and the two world wars. Historians invariably interpret these wars as conflicts between people, but that ignores the curious fact that humans also declared war on many non-human organisms, including rodents, insects, and diseases. Around 1900, an international group of doctors, engineers, intellectuals, journalists, politicians, and scientists declared a worldwide war against rats, as carriers of the third pandemic of bubonic plague, which disease historians have called a global medical disaster and the first authentically global or oceanic pandemic. The plague's early spread is illustrated on this world map. Emerging from Hong Kong in 1894, it made a quick world tour, carried by rats and their fleas, riding the steamships that held up the global economy and the growing overseas empires of Europe, the United States, and Japan. By 1901, only after only seven years, plague reached every continent, including for the first time in history, the Americas, Australia, and many islands such as Madagascar. Contemporaries began to realize that humans had created this pandemic, which offered some bracing lessons for imperialism, environmental management, public health, and overseas shipping about the unintended consequences of human activity. By the 1950s, when the World Health Organization declared it was finished, the pandemic killed at least 15 million people, mostly in Asia, with 12 million in India alone. The pandemic's simultaneity with the familiar era of global and total war is no mere coincidence. The war on rats illustrates how connected plague response and the world wars could be. In this talk, I will argue that humans lost this war on rats and that this loss can teach us about human failings in the face of a pandemic, a story that offers really important historical perspective on today's COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the, the plague emergency, starting in the 1890s, inspired new research in medicine and public health. One major field here was bacteriology, the science of microorganisms and diseases. Uh, early in the pandemic, French and Japanese scientists first identified the plague germ, 
so that it could be detected in blood and tissue samples under microscopes. Scientists also rushed to develop serum therapy and vaccines, which remained experimental and controversial. Bacteriologists discovered that plague is bloodborne and usually reaches humans through fleas infected by biting other animals, mostly rodents. A second major plague science was epidemiology, which studies the contagion, movement, and transmission of disease across time and place. Epidemiologists found that rats, fleas, and plague had circled the world more quickly thanks to modern transportation technologies, steamships, and railways. By building the steam-powered infrastructure networks that enabled the global economy, overseas empires, and the world wars, humans had accidentally spread plague farther and faster, especially in shipments of clothing and food and raw materials, which attract rats. Together, bacteriology and epidemiology show how emerging plague science gave rats a central role. The photographs here depict three leading advocates of rat science and rat war. On the left is Emil Zuschlag, the Danish engineer and hygienist who founded the International Association for the Rational Destruction of Rats around 1900. In the center is the Frenchman Adrien Loire, a nephew of Louis Pasteur, the famous father of bacteriology, vaccines, and pasteurized food. Loire worked in public hygiene and agricultural science. He was vice president of Zuschlag's International Association, and he founded a club for people who were interested in breeding and training cats as rat fighters. On the right is the British scientist Sir James Crichton Brown, known for his early work in neuroscience, but also in sanitary engineering, which is where he met with Zuschlag, Loire, and other experts from continental Europe. Working together, these men organized the world's first voluntary civil associations to advocate for killing rats. In the early 1900s, they publicized this war on rats around the world, especially in 1908, when they reached American, British, French, Chinese, Japanese, and Australian news outlets, as well as several journals in colonial agriculture for areas including Hawaii, the Philippines, and Ceylon. Now, although rats are neither the only rodents nor the only mammals that carry plague, they were easy to scapegoat in the Western world because since biblical times, they have been greeted with disgust, fear, and hatred. Rat war advocates called rats a scourge, plague, or menace, similar to an epidemic or a natural disaster, often a flood. Uh, rats were disgusting, destructive, and dangerous. More than just pests or vermin, rats were cast in colorful and deeply problematic terms as enemies, even a whole race or kind, to be eradicated. People gave rats familiar human roles, calling them refugees, stowaways, immigrants, intruders, invaders, thieves, or even colonizers or conquerors. We should recognize these animalizing and dehumanizing analogies between people and rats as familiar artifacts from the sad history of eugenics, racism, and genocide. The way that people made enemies of rats can shed light on how we cast certain human groups as social enemies in unfair and unjust ways. And these analogies between humans and rats run through my research project. Scholars who study rats' role in human society often repeat the idea that rats and humans are twin, mirror, or shadow species. This pairing of humans and rats has biological and evolutionary roots. Biologists classify rats as an inquiline species to humans, which makes them our tenants. They make their homes inside our buildings and our ships. Centuries of living together have raised some interesting questions about how well we get along. At best, Rats are commensal species who cohabitate without harming us. At worst, they're more like a parasitic species, spoiling or stealing our resources and delivering us all different kinds of disease, including plague. There are also some historical and social questions about how rats and humans live together. Many scholars have called the two species similar mammals because we are uniquely effective and cruel in making war on our own kinds and on other kinds. The British historian Jonathan Burt 
found that rats are known for, as he put it, thriving on those areas of human activity which are deemed to be most problematic, such as war and imperialism. Rats are also linked with other problems of human society, such as disease, poverty, violence, slum housing, and displaced people who become refugees. Thus, we often view rat infestation as a sign of social failure or weakness. The Dutch author Martin Hart wrote that mankind blames rats for its own shortcomings. So rats thrive where humans don't maintain our health and hygiene, our economy and our laws, our buildings and our boats, or our vigilance. So do fleas, and so does plague. So the war on rats thus shows a series of really intriguing connections between war on animals and war among people. It is no coincidence that the third plague pandemic, the war on rats, colonial wars, and the world wars all happened in this same half century, starting in the mid-1890s. Rat war was often part of waging human wars. Warfare and pest control also shared tactics, such as destroying homes and displ displacing people, and weapons, such as poison gas and germ agents. Rat war, as it was called, was never just metaphorical. So unlike many social campaigns called war, like the wars on drugs, poverty, or germs, rat warfare was more literal because it aimed to kill rats as enemies of public health. My research uh, is really interested in the hidden human impacts of this rat war. And because rats live most closely with socially vulnerable populations, the rat war often spilled over into a kind of war against vulnerable people. The new medical and scientific research on rats and plague encouraged closer contacts between doctors and politicians, and this helped foster major growth in medical institutions in health bureaucracies, uh, in government public health functions, the first health insurance systems, and a zealous popular hygiene movement. Many governments in Asia, Europe, and North America, for example, the United States, France, and China, built their first public health services during the pandemic's peak in the early 1900s. The plague also inspired new forms of international cooperation, which led to the first major international organizations for governing health on a global scale. These institutions grew in stages. The International Office of Public Hygiene, founded in Paris in 1903, and the League of Nations Health Organization, which operated from the 1920s to the 1940s, both of those organizations later folded into the World Health Organization, which opened in 1948. After the 1920s, Paris also hosted the International Office of Animal Disease, or Epizootics, which monitored plague. Um, the official sounding names of these organizations obscure the fact that plague response could often become discriminatory, heavy-handed, even violent. American, British, French, Chinese, and Japanese officials used arson to burn germs, to burn human corpses, to burn rats dead or alive, to burn household objects, whole houses, and even whole neighborhoods. So I wanna talk about a specific example. Following the Spanish-American War of 1898, Hawaii had just entered the US empire when plague struck Honolulu in 1899. As in many other Pacific ports, plague hit hard in Chinatown. American agents torched targeted structures to kill rats and plague, but the fire spread out of control, burned for 18 days, and leveled the whole of Chinatown. The photographs on the right of this slide show Chinatown burning above and burnt below. This looks like mass destruction only before the world wars, born from the ancient practice of purifying plague with fire. Targeting Chinatown also indicates how Americans scapegoated social outsiders, ethnic minorities, and immigrants, forms of injustice that haunted plague responses worldwide. Chinese immigrants, especially the migrant laborers known as coolies, were singled out across Asia and the Pacific, in Australia, in British Columbia, in California, in Hawaii, in Japan, in Manchuria, Vietnam, and Singapore. During the 1920 Paris plague, the French scapegoated Jewish, Muslim, and African immigrants. And during the 1924 Los Angeles plague, health officials targeted the Mexican community. 
Now, Plague Town reached Cape Town in South Africa early on in 1901, spurred along by the stresses of the Second Boer War, uh, in which the British and the Dutch fought over colonial South Africa. Historians agree that concentration camps originated in this conflict, although British colonists had previously used temporary camps to enforce plague quarantines in India. There, plague-stricken inmates, as the British called them, were, quote, accommodated in carefully supervised health camps, also referred to as segregation camps. Officials wrote, quote, the government of Bombay reported that it was not possible to carry out the full measures of segregation, which were rep recognized to be desirable, end quote. So not only did they try to isolate the sick, they also tried to protect buildings and people from animals, germs, and weather. Across South Africa in the early 1900s, so-called native locations for black subjects often began as plague isolation camps and gradually became lasting precursors to apartheid. When plague struck Johannesburg in 1904, Mahatma Gandhi was there and protested that British colonists unjustly scapegoated and segregated South Asian immigrants. This, this occurred outside the British Empire as well. On the left is a map of Dakar, Senegal, the capital of France's colonies in West Africa. The severe 1914 plague there led the French to destroy many African houses and create a native quarter, which they called Medina, uh, which you can see outside from and separate from the center city uh, on the map on the left. So as plague rocked the early 1900s, methods of biologically isolating the sick blurred with ways of socially isolating different racial or or ethnic groups, especially in major colonial cities like Bombay, Cape Town, Johannesburg, and Dakar. Now, based on centuries of quarantine practices, spatial isolation of the sick was central to plague response. Bacteriology demanded a lot of isolation. Microorganisms isolated in petri dishes, rats isolated from fleas, sterile spaces separated from germs, and laboratories proofed against the weather. British plague responders in India often detailed the rat-proof, flea-proof, and weather-proof features of their labs, their hospitals, and their quarantine camps. In Ghana, they boasted that their post-mortem room was fly-proof. Public health also pushed forms of spatial isolation, quarantines for neighborhoods, hospital isolation for individual patients. Um, thus, rat science and medicine drove the creation of spaces that had been proofed against all manner of intruders, insects, mammals, germs, water, and the weather. Across the American, British, and French empires, and soon the Russian and Japanese as well, plague swelled during colonial wars and thrived in these colonial port cities, which were home to racial or ethnic segregation, deep inequality, and crowded urban slums. Imperial plague responses were often authoritarian, racist, and violent people became collateral damage in uh, these campaigns to destroy plague, to destroy rats or slums, and to purify them with fire. People who weren't killed were often temporarily confined to hospitals, camps, or their homes, or even makeshift spaces like retrofit train cars, or they were permanently displaced from home. Plague response in the rat war could therefore reveal slippery slopes from scapegoating down toward genocide. Rat war often brought out the worst in people, uh, one reason that I would argue it's a loss. Now, it's also important to note that the scientists, journalists, and politicians, the educated middle-class men who promoted and advocated rat war, did not kill rats with their own hands. So rat hunts often began with government employees who were used to dirty work sewer workers, sanitation workers, or soldiers. In French colonial Madagascar, rat hunting teams employed prisoners overseen by police. But larger hunts required a lot more labor, and that was supplied by voluntary or coerced work from socially vulnerable populations, including children, the poor, homeless, peasants, and colonial subjects. Such socially vulnerable and economically marginal groups either could not refuse, needed the money, or were willing to accept dirty and difficult work. On the left is a photo that Emil Zuschlag sent to National Geographic magazine of Danish boys and girls lined up 
to turn in dead rats to the police on the right, who have buckets there to poison or drown the rats and to keep them contained and counted. On the right, we see a pile of dead rats at a drop-off station in Philadelphia around 1914. Although rat hunts could create massive body counts, sometimes millions, their impact was limited and temporary. Rats always returned, making hunts most useful for short-term and emergency plague response. Bounties, sweepstakes, and other financial incentives were common for hunters. One source even mentioned movie tickets being traded for rat corpses. But historians have shown that these incentives could become perverse incentives, which encouraged people to breed rats or otherwise try to cheat the rules of the hunt for money. Rat hunts varied in length from a day to a month or longer, and they were run by city or colonial governments, but also by voluntary civil associations like Sushlars. Rat hunting techniques in the early 1900s were rather consistent across the world, from Africa to uh, Europe, Asia, and the Americas. Now, rat hunts did not always kill rats, but alive or dead, rats were always brought to a central, often governmental location, such as police and fire stations or sanitation offices, where they were counted and sometimes traded for that financial reward I mentioned. Sometimes trophies, most often tails, could stand in for entire rats, but that practice could backfire. Clever people began breeding rats, cutting off their tails, and collecting the bounty without killing any animals. Other cheats included fake tails and tails from different rodents. Now these failures were actually predicted in Japan in 1900 and later came true in French colonial Vietnam and Dutch colonial Indonesia. Rat breeding for profit even reached Paris, France in the 1930s. Uh, where officials demanded whole rats, they sometimes disinfected or destroyed rats and fleas with fire, with acids, even gasoline or electrocution. But other times, dead rats were conserved intact for scientific study. Rat hunts required careful body counts. A vast effort of data collection began. The number of rats collected at the official drop site would become the official body count, which could set the amount of bounty paid and hopefully add up to an impressive number that would boost morale. In Sydney, Australia around 1900, plague responders enacted what they called rat intelligence, in which a special team of paid rat warriors, distinct from the Australian and men pictured here uh, ensured that rats captured or killed made it to labs for testing before carefully recording and reporting all their results. Rat counts had to be carefully produced and legally enforced. For example, um, Suschlag reported that in Denmark, um, breeding and protecting rats were outlawed, but so was turning in captured rats outside the city where they were caught. So they legally enforced uh, techniques for counting rats. Now, unfortunately, there was a deeper scientific problem here. Even the most impressive numbers, for example, the British claimed to have killed 12 million rats in India way back in 1881, um, these numbers meant very little with no baseline measurement of the world's rat population. Scientists began working toward estimates, but these remained difficult and controversial for many decades. Long after the pandemic ended, animal ecologists could not agree on any workable rule of thumb for estimating rat population. Martin Hart called rat counts particularly difficult and Hans Zinser called them obviously impossible. So after rats were caught and counted, they were passed on to lab technicians, again, often government employees who examined rats physically, combing them for fleas and tracking plague symptoms using dissection and microscopes. Here we see pictures from the New Orleans rat lab around World War I. Um, captured rats were a precious source of scientific data to be carefully examined and harvested for samples. These rat labs produced the plague counts to match the official rat counts. But where did all these numbers go? Well, the numbers ended up organized in vast tables of data like the one pictured on the right, as well as in other documents, building and ship inspections, quarantine reports, and surveys of rat ecology. Tables counted humans and rats killed or autopsied, 
fleas collected, and the number of confirmed plague cases in rats, other rodents, fleas, and humans. All this data then was sorted by species, by date, and by geographic location. These tables were published in scientific journals, trade journals, and government documents, and then selectively reprinted in the mass press as magazines and newspapers covered the rat world. Data tables like this were notably global in orientation, providing vital information for travelers, such as migrants, navigators, sailors, merchants, or colonizers, anyone who moved people or materials over long distances and knew that rats, fleas, and plague traveled by ship. Brief reports also offered practical advice on waging your own rat war at home, how to disinfect houses, how to trap and poison rats, how to repel fleas, or how to organize your own local bounty hunt. Rat science demanded stockpiles of well-organized information. Now, much of this work goes unnoticed in the history of science because rat surveying like this is unglamorous applied field work. Uh, like rat hunts, rat labs were sometimes staffed with people from vulnerable social groups. Hong Kong's rat labs, for example, used coolies or Chinese migrant laborers to do the dirtiest work. Above all, these tables and charts of rat data reflected the idea that successful rat war could be measured numerically as less rats and less plague. These rat tables are the editorial products of the rat war's body counts and practices of data management. Now, uh, another aspect of hunting rats is the weapons used. And biological weapons could include many different variants, um, including natural predators, including snakes, cats, Weasels, as seen on the left image here, often ferrets. Uh, the mongoose was sometimes used, but most of all, dogs, specifically rat terriers, including the Jack Russell Terrier. Um, germ warfare against rats began with a French engineered salmonella called Pasteur or Danish virus after the Paris based Polish scientist Jean Danish, who's seen in the center of this slide in his Pasteur Institute lab cooking up big vats of some kind of substance. Um, the British Liverpool virus was one of a dozen different um, rat germ agents that you could purchase in these years. Now on the right, um, we're hearing about, from a newspaper article, about William Rodier of Melbourne, Australia, who promoted a new method of pest control that he got from the scientific idea of sex ratios. The plan that he devised was to catch rodents, kill the females, and release the males. In his idea, this would leave less females to reproduce and increase male competition for habitat, food, and mates. Rat colonies would eat themselves. Um, Rodier was fighting Australia's notorious rabbit problem, but he and his followers agreed that it would work for rats too. Dr. George Jennison, director of the Manchester Zoo, favored Rodier's system over poisons and other rat killers because it could reduce fecundity of the entire rat race, amounting to what the New York Times called race suicide. Other American publications wrote that rats would exterminate themselves or cause their own extinction. This was negative eugenics, but for rats. The photo seen here depicts frozen piles of dead bodies awaiting cremation, which starkly illustrates one of the most dramatic and deadly episodes of the pandemic, Manchuria, in the fall of 1910 into the winter of 1911. This region north of Korea was the object of major imperial competition. China, Japan, and Russia all struggled to control, develop, and exploit the territory while uh, European and American imperialists looked on nervously. New railways provided the pathways for plague to travel inland. Uh, and the fur trade in Siberian marmots, also known as tarbigans, created a biological vector for the plague. Within a year, 40 to 60,000 people died of the deadly pneumonic strain of plague, which affects the lungs. Um, and the episode helped modernize China's public health system. Uh, it also highlighted a practical problem for the war on rats. Rats were not the only rodents that can carry plague, as Chinese plague scientist and later Nobel Prize winner Wu Lian Te discovered. 
Around this same time, a California study found plague in both tree squirrels and ground squirrels, and a British study confirmed plague in guinea pigs. By 1955, French bacteriologist Georges Girard counted 186 distinct rodent species that carry human plague. So although a war on marmots, guinea pigs, or prairie dogs would have been perfectly justified by plague's biology, these species, unlike rats, did not have a bad reputation dating back to biblical times. This single-minded focus on rats reminds us that the war on rats involved important cultural, ideological, and irrational aspects. It was motivated as much by the symbolic meanings of rat kind as it was motivated by stopping plague. Just as ethnic minorities were socially scapegoated for plague, so rats were biologically scapegoated for plague, unfairly blamed for problems much bigger than themselves, which they did not cause, and of which they were often the victims. During World War I, trench warfare on the Western Front in Europe attracted thousands of rats, uh, popular wartime photographs and prints often look like the French examples on the left, uh, depicting proud soldiers and their enthusiastic terriers displaying their catch. Soldiers hunted rats for fun and for bounty money. Uh, this French source calls it sport. But other times, rat catching was an emergency. The Australian soldier Irving Billig was so scarred by trench rats chewing on his boots and on his toes at night that he became New York City's most famous exterminator after the war. On the right is a photo of a French soldier in his custom-made rat-proof bed with its wire mesh dome. Meanwhile, on the home front, uh, warring nations felt pressure to conserve their resources, population, materials, fuel, and food. The leading American rat researcher and rat warrior David Lance urged in a widely reprinted piece that Americans should save food by destroying rats. He explained, in the face of food conditions forced upon us by the war, suppression of the rat menace is a measure for economic gain as well as national security. World War I also kept alive comparisons of rats to people. Both Rudyard Kipling and several French writers compared rats to the German enemy. Other French authors in more baldly racist ways wrote phrases like rats do like the Negro or referred to immigrants and refugees as human vermin. Now on the American home front, World War I bought, uh, I'm gonna pause there. On the American home front, World War I brought a wave of locally organized anti-rat activity. In 1914, the state of Indiana named one day a year for rat war on which, as they put it, every man, woman, and child is enlisted for the fight. One article justified the war by noting the rat is a noted immigrant. So defense of nations against enemies, regions against immigrants, and communities against disease often got interwoven in such rhetoric. Rat killing days would also open in other US states, Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky, and Louisiana. The images on this slide come from 1917. The Boston Women's League, an association for reform and philanthropy, organized a rat day to conduct local bounty hunts across the city. The league printed flyers in English, Italian, Polish, and Yiddish to recruit local immigrant communities to join the fight. This example shows that rat war was a way for women, children, and others who didn't fight in human warfare to be mobilized usefully on the home front for the war effort. Soon, women's leagues in Green Bay and in Baltimore would organize anti-rat campaigns, now with national backing from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. These examples show how rat war could build on existing social movements, such as suffragism, feminism, and municipal housekeeping. In 1918, Morgan County, Indiana held a rat week the Indiana Farmer's Guide described a concerted attack. County officials had enlisted hunters from a group called the United States Boys Working Reserve. This was a home front volunteer club for young patriots who killed more than 500 rodents. Similarly, 
Boy Scouts were often recruited to help. Um, back into the previous century, rat catching was promoted as a wholesome pursuit for adolescent boys. The British author H.C. Barclay, for example, sought to give boys a taste for a wholesome country pastime, as he put it, which would teach them values of manly virtue and community service. Bands of ratting boys shared something with scouts and militias, but were more spontaneous and less official. Still, they could be enlisted. The Indiana Reserve's paramilitary language reveals that for them, rat war served the US and its allies in World War I. Soldiers and civilians alike might be called to duty. These American anti-rat campaigns recruited women, children, and others who could not, by the social norms of the era, go fight overseas. But their rat wars at home would mirror those in the trenches on the battlefront. Now, before uh, poison gas became one of the most ethically scandalous weapons of World War I, it was invented to fumigate pests. The British Clayton process or Clayton machine piped sulfur dioxide gas from a small oven into a closed space. This effective killer could damage cargo and so is much more useful for empty trains or ships, but also for sewers, and it became the world's leading fumigation approach. By contrast, uh, there was a German process called the noch Gimse process out of Hamburg, which used carbon monoxide and nitrogen, which protected cargo a little more from damage. During the 1911 Manchurian plague, Chinese officials printed 24,000 leaflets, urging locals to ignite their traditional Chinese New Year's fireworks indoors so that the sulfurous smoke could fumigate their houses. Chloropicrin, uh, which is a broad spectrum poison that kills animals, plants, insects, fungi, and microbes, was discovered in uh, 1848, but rarely used until World War I, when it suddenly became the most common gas on the battlefield. After the war, exterminators would use it to asphyxiate rats and fleas, or just to flush rats from their burrows. Today, police use it as a tear gas to control and disperse crowds. After 1918, the US Chemical Weapons Service uh, adapted battlefield weapons, including cyanide, phosgene, and mustard gas for the rat war, while the German chemist, Fritz Haber, used his wartime work on chemical weapons to open up a pest control business, which would eventually lead to the gases that killed so many in the Nazi Holocaust. Uh, as you see in, on the slide here, in the center, rat fighters in Michigan's Motor City even used carbon monoxide automobile exhaust to try and asphyxiate rats. Um, so as gas war moved from the battlefront to the home front, um, other things shifted as well. The gas mask, invented to protect soldiers, suddenly became standard equipment for exterminators. Also in the aftermath of World War I, the, uh, the British pursued the institutional growth of rat war much more aggressively than many other nations. Following a 1919 law, the Rats and Mice Destruction Bill, Britain opened a nationwide rat week each autumn between September and November until the 1940s. Citizens were expected to keep their own properties clean and to make a blitz during the chosen week to destroy as many rats as possible. The advertisement on the left reminds us that commercial agents also wanted a piece of the rat war, both to help control pests and plague, but also to make a profit. Just like my opening slide, this advertisement uses the imagery of war here alluding to ambushes and surprise attacks. At the same time, it was the years after World War I um, when many people began to worry about the effectiveness of rat war. Without a reliable rat population count, how could we know if we were winning the war? After more than two decades of hard-fought battle, new strategies of rat control began to emerge. Now, chief among them was rat proofing, which seeks not to destroy rats, but to destroy their resources and their habitats, to environmentally engineer them out of human society. Especially important was shipping infrastructure, docks, freighters, warehouses, and wharves. Rat proofing shifted focus away from killing rats and suggested more qualitative measures of success. 
aspects of environmental quality, including humidity, uh, cleanliness, food availability, and solidity of construction. It also meant carefully choosing materials in maintaining the built environment, which encouraged the growing popularity of steel and concrete as construction materials. Although the goal remained reducing rat density in the human world, the means to this end were changing radically. The key was to deny rats food, water, shelter, and transportation. This required many different tasks, closing holes through which rats could get into walls or floors, making spaces more airtight and waterproof, uh, replacing porous materials with rigid ones, and setting up routine inspection, cleaning, waste disposal, and disinfection with liquid or gas. Accordingly, material culture transformed in many ways. Manhole covers got smaller vents. Um, people added grating or screening to cover ducts, pipes, windows. Um, automatic door closers were installed. Uh, people put tighter lids on storage and garbage bins. And people also suffered new chemical exposures at work and at home. Ships like the one seen on the left here anchored further from docks to prevent rats swimming or jumping aboard, and the cables or ropes that held ships at dock were fit with cone or disc-shaped guards called bafflers to prevent rats from climbing aboard. Uh, workers would also raise the gangway of the ship each night. Ideally, all infrastructures for commerce, shipping, and storage would be built, maintained, and operated to repel or exclude rats. Now, other people were more uh, specifically worried about the violence and danger of the rat war. George Jennison, the zoo director in Manchester, England, became a major spokesperson in the English language press for William Rodier's system of rat control by sexual selection. Another supporter of Rodier was Bruce Cartwright, secretary of the Hawaii Fish and Game Association. These men, with their sort of zoological and wildlife interests, promoted Rodier's approach uh, partly because of safety concerns about rat hunts, especially rat poisons, which occasionally killed people or animals by accident. Um, critics of rat hunts saw them as risky and uncivilized, base, barbaric, dirty, and violent. Journalists sometimes cataloged the underrepresented human victims of rat war. Um, Cartwright contrasted the scientific and rational character of Rodier's method with the indiscriminate killing of male and female rats alike. Jennison wrote, quote, rat poisoning must cease and rat killing as a sport must be banned. Advocates of Rodier's system thus demanded a shift from quantitative to qualitative criteria in the struggle against rats. It was no longer a question of how many rats were killed, but rather which rats were killed and how they were killed. It also mattered deeply who killed them although this was rarely said. Rodier's supporters, like Jennison and Cartwright, uh, called for ending all informal, ad hoc, voluntary, sporting, and local rat hunts for two different reasons. First, because they were not systematic or scientific enough, and secondly, because they were risky for the socially vulnerable people who hunted. In effect, Rodier provided a rationale for professionalizing rat control, taking it out of lay people's hands and keeping it in those that worked in science, sanitation, or sewers. The French colonial scientist, Dr. Reynaud of Algeria, condemned both sewer fumigation and bounty hunts on similar grounds because they put the public, without proper training or equipment, into dangerous proximity to rats, plague, and poisons. In 1936, the American Society of Zoologists and the Ecological Society of America passed resolutions against the wholesale destruction of what they called so-called vermin. Life scientists were beginning to reflect on rat war and other animal extermination campaigns and to see them as attacks on wildlife and affronts to nature conservation. There were other scientific reasons why on the eve of the Second World War, rat war began to come under fire. For one, Decades of bacteriology and epidemiology had shown that rats weren't the only ones that carried plague. And for another, um, animal biologists now had a much clearer sense of just how quickly and exponentially rats reproduce. Rat war looked a lot less necessary and a lot less possible by the time World War II came around. 
And yet, the rat hunting continued. On the left, uh, we see a 1944 feature story from American Life magazine, which depicts seven-year-old Robert de Glopper, the champion rat killer of Grand Island, New York. He reminds us that children were often used as rat hunters, but also that women and children were mobilized on the home front during human wars. The caption explains, Robert uses money received as rat bounty to buy war stamps. Now on the right, um, we're seeing that by World War II, both offensive and defensive aspects of germ war, including plague, were major concerns of governments, armies, and scientists. Uh, most notorious, perhaps, is what's depicted here, that is Japan's top secret germ warfare unit 731, which released plague-infected fleas on Chinese and Soviet victims, although clearly many nations share the blame for the violence of germ war during World War II. Also during World War II, images of rats, race, and wartime enemies crescendoed when Nazis incessantly called Jews rats, while Americans did the same to their enemies, the Japanese. During the World Wars, human enemies were often animalized and dehumanized as pests to be exterminated. On the left is a Nazi leaflet printed in Russian that was dropped on Soviet territory to foster anti-Semitism and dissent within the Soviet ranks, which compared Jews to rats. On the right, we see a racist propaganda poster by the American Douglas Aircraft Company, which depicts uh, Japanese Emperor Hirohito as a rat caught in the trap of material conservation. The poster reminds us that rat war played a major role in wartime austerity around conserving material resources. But both images here remind us that human enemies and rat en enemies have been connected in ways that are dehumanizing and racist. Like germ warfare, both sides in World War II share blame for racist and dehumanizing ways of thinking, which were long encouraged by the war on rats. Now, uh, by the time World War II ended, the global war on rats was fading. New chemical technologies had sidestepped the rat. The powerful toxic pesticide DDT could kill fleas, and new antibiotics uh, could kill plague. This made rat war and even rat control relatively obsolete as plague controls, although they remained useful for addressing other problems in agriculture, ecology, and public health. Rat war continued on a smaller local scale without the fear and sense of emergency of the pandemic. As plague receded in the 1950s, emergency plague measures gave way to routine maintenance. Rat infestation went from an acute to a chronic problem. These shifts did indeed take human violence against animals out of the public eye. And in so doing, they also submerged the human consequences of this violence covering over two more fundamental problems. First were those racist, eugenic, and genocidal views, which allowed rat war to spill over into human violence. Second were the impacts on vulnerable populations, children, the poor, homeless, peasants, prisoners, and colonized people. And that brings me to my conclusion. Um, I wanna conclude by saying that the rat war was lost for two reasons. First, because we did not and could not kill all the rats. That's a simple practical loss. But secondly, um, this was also a moral loss because it inspired the worst in us, racism, scapegoating, segregation, and violence. Animal control turned out to be all too human, bound up with disease control, population control, and social control. Rat war subjected the poor and powerless to scapegoating, surveillance, chemical exposure, plague exposure, dirty work, forced relocation, quarantine, even destruction of their property. So rat war carried risks for both those who hunted rats and those who were caught in the cross crossfire. For example, stowaways hidden in ships who were accidentally gassed, people who ate poison that was intended for rats, and severe outbreaks of pneumonic plague in the most neglected and oppressed communities, colonial ports, and urban slums. The plague emergency, applied rat science, and new destructive technologies 
had deep ethical impacts on human-animal and human-human relations amid the whirlwind of modernity characterized by world war, globalization, and imperialism. And I want to end with three lessons and three suggestions. The first lesson concerns how we use medicine and science to justify violence. Plague responders appealed to bacterial isolation to justify segregation and apartheid, but also displacement and arson. In short, the rat war shows how germ control can slip into social control. A second lesson concerns how we construct human enemies by likening them to undesirable animals, especially rats. In 2018, when President Trump said of Central American migrants, these aren't people, these are animals, he evoked a long line of racist rhetoric that cut its teeth on the rat war in the early 1900s. Amid backlash against Trump's language, he later doubled down, describing in immigrants in even rattier terms as an infestation and an invasion. However, Trump's opponents also sometimes make reference to rats in their rhetoric. Today, internet chatter calls people who won't wear masks or take other precautions against COVID-19 rat lickers, now a popular hashtag on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. The third lesson concerns how we use the uh, distinction between murder, defined as killing that is morally wrong, and morally neutral killing, such as pest control, or slaughtering animals for meat um, in order to obscure the violence of killing animals or to erase how that violence affects humans as well as animals. Regarding the weapons of rat war, we often hide their ethical importance um, because they were not designed for violence against humans, thereby ignoring how they can be used against humans. I also wanna offer these three suggestions for how not to stop a pandemic. The first suggestion is to beware of scapegoating, blaming victims, and disease profiling by social category. The Western tradition of sinophobia around disease, which dates back to the 1300s, has renewed purchase in Trump's America, where COVID-19 is sometimes called the China or Chinese virus. The second suggestion is beware of social conditions that increase disease risk, and therefore fight disease by reducing social inequality move from operating on people to operating on their social conditions. Include social welfare measures in public health care campaigns. Today's stimulus checks, unemployment benefits, and the Paycheck Protection Program all operate in this way, but perhaps they don't go far enough. The CARES Act is necessary, but not sufficient. Access to COVID tests in particular has been inadequate. And my third and final suggestion is beware of single issue public health campaigns. The obsessive focus on rats not only distracted health officials from the more than 180 other rodents that carry plague, but also from the important role of fleas in the broader ecology. Similarly, rat proofing works much better and causes less collateral damage than does rat hunting because it broadens the approach by taking a more holistic ecological perspective. Disease ecology and epidemiology are complex things, which demand a less reductionist approach. While bacteriology encourages reductionist explanations of disease that boil down its causes to microorganisms, epidemiology urges us to consider multiple vehicles of disease, including human behavior, ecological factors, and transportation technology, all of which were as crucial in spreading pandemic plague a century ago as they are in spreading the coronavirus today. And in sum, the failures of the rat war, I hope, can help us plan better public health policy and public health practice today. Thank you for listening. What a wonderful presentation. You, you certainly covered a lot of ground and touched on a lot of areas of, uh, um, you know, different areas of history throughout, the, throughout those decades. And the war on rats uh, seemed to, parallel a, a lot of other social movements you know that the chinese exclusion act uh, almost exactly parallels the time frame I, I think from the 1880s to the 1940s and was very much so was uh, the war on rats uh, part of that the, the, the political impetus well i think um or certainly fed into it maybe and 
Yeah, I definitely think there's a connection between um, the anti-immigrant sentiments represented by, you know, laws like the Chinese Exclusion Act in the United States and the sort of mood around the rat war. That is, you know, it might not have been the exact same people advocating for new immigration controls and new rat hunting techniques, but both activities, as seemingly separate as they are, draw on this very deep well in the Western world of blaming the Chinese for disease. And disease was indeed one of the biggest rationales behind the Chinese Exclusion Act. So you often see um, newspaper or magazine caricatures from that era that depict, uh, especially caricatures that are critiquing the Chinese Exclusion Act, that depict a kind of forlorn Chinese immigrant identifiable by his very traditional dress, who's sitting on his pile of luggage in many images, and the luggage is labeled with disease names. So that literally it's, it's shown as if all he's bringing into the country are suitcases full of cholera and tuberculosis and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and so it, it, really, it really does draw, I think, on this very deep Western tradition that as far as I can tell dates back to the moment of blaming the Mongols for the Black Death in the 1300s. I also like the slides or the photographs of uh, rat proofing ships. And I, I, I spent some time in the Navy. And I, as you were oh, yeah. talking early in the presentation, I'm thinking about rat guards on lines. I, like, I wonder when that uh, came about and why didn't they do that sooner? And um, it, it's, it's certainly an easy step. And it just makes a lot of sense that, um, you know, finally the, the thinking shifted more to rat proofing and yeah. actually killing rats. So uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, killing Killing rats really is a losing battle. <laughs> they just they just reproduce too quickly, um, and they're too adaptable. They they live in every kind of imaginable environment that humans can create. Um, but rat control is a lot smarter in the sense that it's preventative, and I think um, that might hint at yet another recommendation for public health, which is that we should tip the balance and put more of our money and energy toward the preventative measures rather than the reactive measures. Right, uh, you, you mentioned Hawaii is, is one of the hot spots early on in the war on rats and, they're, and they, they brought in the mongoose to kill the rats. You mentioned that and showed a picture, I think, of, of that. And uh, today there are plenty of rats in Hawaii and also the, the mongoose population is very strong. So. It, yeah, mongooses, so mongooses are obviously fearsome predators and they became very famous in British India, right? And then the British began exporting them all around the world in an attempt to control certain pests, whether snakes or rats. Um, and so Hawaii is not the only other island that's a major hub in kind of shipping networks or colonial networks um, where they brought in the mongoose and then not only did it not work to kill rats, because rats are much more nocturnal and mongoose is much more diurnal, so they didn't see each other as much as planned, but also the mongooses were such enthusiastic uh, non-native predators that they wiped out a whole bunch of other small animal species. They would eat all the frogs and lizards and birds on the island. Um, so to this day, the biodiversity of those islands has been reduced by the mongoose, and at the same time, I hear that in Puerto Rico, it's still very different to keep backyard chickens because they might get taken by the mongoose. <laughs> I mean, those mongooses, right, originating half the world away in India and brought there by the British in an attempt to control pests. So uh, Jamaica was the first place, I think, where the British tried it all the way back in 1870s and 80s. Uh, really didn't go well. And so I'm not sure why they then applied it to Puerto Rico and to Hawaii, but you know, there's a, there's a load of interesting stories here about why different attempts at doing something in public health, in, in science or in technology fail for one reason or another. I also found it interesting that there eventually became a pushback to the all out killing of rats and the, 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 you used the word, I think mean, the sporting yeah. nature of it. And it, that, um, if I remember correctly, also parallels the uh, pushback against just the sporting killing of birds and other animals, this, uh, the, the environmental movement that began in the early 20th century that tried to eliminate 
a lot of that just sporting, just indiscriminate sporting killing. Uh, just it was interesting to me that, that there's a connection with the sporting killing of rats as well. Absolutely, rat, rat, rat sport, rat killing for sport was very popular in the 19th century. There are amazing stories to be told about um, dog training, rat baiting contests. Um, but but the the critique that you mentioned um, had two prongs, right? First was this moral prong that said look, uh, hunting in this joyful way takes too much pleasure from violence. It's, it's sort of, you know, vicious in its, um, in its uh, putting such a positive moral spin on such a barbaric activity. So that was the one criticism. The other criticism, though, was the environmentalism that you referenced. And these calls from zoologists, from zookeepers, from the Ecological Society of America, from all kinds of people who have different um, stakes in animal science, right? Those calls became louder and louder and they're really interesting precursors to a much more famous critic of pesticides, Rachel Carson, right? And so a lot of this um, really looks like a prehistory of you know, the big, the big uh, splash she made with Silent Spring in the early, in the early 60s. That'll be part two of a presentation one of these days. <laughs> well, yeah, I've got to, I've got to get there at some point. Um, in the meantime, it's been really nice. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to uh, spiff up these materials and, and share them once again. Um, well, this is a project I'm really enthusiastic about. Well, you know, thank you again. It was just fascinating to hear the, the history of all of this. And there, I mean, one more quick thing. There's, sure. There are still animals carrying bubonic plague to this day, right? Yeah, I heard it. You hear in the news every once in a while that a squirrel in Colorado, you know, some kid caught the plague. So it's, it's just, it's, it's still with us today. It is. And that's part of the reason why, I mean, one of those more recent cases popped up in the 1980s in Oklahoma, right here in my neck of the woods. <laughs> a kid, uh, some unlucky kid got uh, contact with prairie dogs. Right, and for, for that reason, um, there's a wildlife preserve here in Oklahoma at the, uh, the Wichita Mountains wildlife area. And um, they have a wonderful uh, set of sort of, you know, iconic wildlife of the Great Plains. They have an elk herd, a buffalo herd, and a pretty extensive prairie dog town, which was one of the main tourist attractions. But they have to give you very clear instructions not to get too close to the prairie dogs because wild prairie dogs are definitely going to have, you know, fleas or lice. And those little critters are the ones that are really going to deliver you the plague. So you can get close enough to prairie dogs to see them well, but don't get close enough for the fleas to make the jump. <laughs> that's, another, that's another good bit of advice to, to conclude the presentation. Dr. Scalza, thank you so much again. And uh, thank you for having me. To, uh, hearing more about your research and uh, when you're able to visit the library in person again one of these days in, well, I look, in a, a post-COVID world. I know, I, I, I'm, I'm waiting for that day as anxiously as you are. And I, I really, um, really did enjoy my time at the library enormously in 2018 and would love to come back and visit you again. All right, thank you again. Yeah, thank you.